So I wanted to um, kind of start off by talking about these uh, uh, these teachings on um, dream marks of existence and um, wanting to emphasize that this is a uh, what I'm sharing in our discussion hopefully will reflect kind of um, different facets of looking at this very rich teaching. That this is not the only way of looking at it or my experiences or what I'm sharing with you is definitely not um, the way, but one of many different ways of kind of um, creating one's own insights into these rich teachings. There's so many different layers. So I'm hoping that you'll, you have your own insights on three marks of existence perhaps already, and you'll meet these teachings in various ways um, in the future too. This is just one aspect that um, I like to offer. And one of the, I think really for me at least inspirational aspects of, of the Dharma is that there's, I think a lot of invitation to create, to be creative and to um, kind of see for ourselves what is true to bring to these teachings to our own practice and to our own life experiences and trying them out for our own kind of our, ourselves. So I want to kind of offer these teachings in the spirit of that collaboration and co-creation. So um, these teachings, the three marks of existence, kind of referring to um, what it means to have a human experience, <laughs> to be alive, to, to be a human, that to be a person, to experience what this is, this humanity, is to be in a world where there's cause and effect, where there's conditions that arise together, where um, there's going to be um, some dukkha, suffering, uh, just, um, and that is the Pali word for this kind of rough translation that sometimes gets translated into suffering, but sometimes also gets translated as stress or anxiety or unease or just unsatisfactory, unsatisfactoriness, unsatisfactoriness rather. And um, impermanence, that conditions change, that no one aspect of our existence is permanent. And that um, there is not this concrete one way of being, this non-self. So I wanted to explore all of those aspects with you. Kind of see, delve into these questions of ultimately, well, okay, are these teachings that are just kind of like commandments that, okay, what do I do with that? Or are these insights? And I'd like to um, put forth the idea that these are insights, practices that we kind of discover for ourselves that this is true for our own experience. And these insights give us something to um, kind of co-create our own sense of wisdom and maybe a greater ease with our lives, giving ourselves maybe when we have these insights or kind of have a wise relationship to these aspects of existence, that we're giving ourselves some spaciousness for liberation, that we can lead freer, uh, a freer existence. It gives room for compassion and joy and happiness. At the very least, um, some ease. So you are aware there's a lot of lists within Dharma practice, and this is one of them. I have like the Four Noble Truths, Eightfold Path, uh, three marks of existence, and they kind of all kind of depend on one another, like one flows from the other. So I'll just name them again. If, um, and I wanna go through each of them just a little bit and then talk about them more holistically. Um, there's kind of the first impermanence, the, um, the Pali word anicca, um, suffering or unsatisfactoriness, dukkha, and uh, not self, anatta, kind of this empty kind of, ex not emptiness, uh, yeah, a sort of emptiness that there is not like a concrete and indivisible one way of being of myself or what I am or me that never ever changes. So on one level with impermanence, there's this kind of um, very kind of everyday kind of existence of impermanence where we can see or experience or know that 
things are constantly changing. When I say things, it could be very much like physical phenomena. The earth, the geological time, uh, continents shifting, mountains occurring, earthquakes happening. The weather changes constantly from one moment to the next. Our bodies, we were born and they don't stay the same. We're not the same as we were when we were babies. That's pretty obvious. Our overwhelming majority of people on this planet, right? So there's that impermanence. And we may know that on a very kind of um, kind of elementary level, like, well, yeah, there's, you know, the sun sets, the moon, the moon comes out at night. And it's like, there's all these physical phenomena, but do we really know that? Do we, how can we really rest with the change of our lives where what is also true is there's uh, a lot of loss. And so that can be really hard, that bittersweet aspect of impermanence where on one hand, um, there can be a lot of peace in knowing that whatever that we're going through in any given moment, if there's a lot of heartache or sadness, that will not last. There's something to that. And it can be really hard to kind of um, really know that on the heart, right? To be told in the midst of heartache, this isn't gonna last. I don't know how useful that is. I haven't felt it to, be, to really take that in. That being said, there's something to that to come back to. So I think that this can be a way of kind of uh, remembering kind of almost like where life is a sort of kind of a form of a meditation. It can be our experience to really come back to what does it mean to have impermanence? What is this kind of, what does this tell us of how we want to then respond to the facts of our life, to the this aspect of our life that's gonna be there no matter what. And this response to impermanence can lie our freedom, right? So there can be loss, there can be heartache. Impermanence will be there. One response can be, and can very much be the wise response is adding some kindness and compassion for ourselves and other people experiencing loss through impermanence going to be here no matter what. So there's this kind of call for us to normalize that. And that could be very powerful because I think that there's so many messages, whether through our families of origin or the culture at large, when I say culture, I'm talking about mainstream US culture, just to posit, like to get some framework of at least what I'm talking about. Or it's like, well, we want things to be always the same. So much of our suffering that goes into kind of S aspect of these three uh, marks of existence. B, this sense of why isn't this the same? Or chasing pleasure, this kind of um, kind of um, rope burns of experience. So I don't want to lose this. This is hard. Or I want to stay with this pleasure. I don't want to lose this either. Or I don't want to experience this loss. So we are not bad for experiencing impermanence. <laughs> I think that can be kind of like a, a message that some of us somehow get or have an unexamined belief. That if something, if we things are not staying the same the way we want to, perhaps we're doing something wrong. Why didn't this person stay? Why didn't this job stay the same way that I wanted it to? To come back to remembering that this is a part of of what it is to be a human being. And in that normalization, we're giving ourselves a chance to open that door to compassion and kindness. This is a possible way of reacting and giving ourselves a break that this isn't always easy. So in that kind of relationship to impermanence, there's this kind of, uh, so often happens, this dukkha, this suffering. So much of our suffering can be a reaction to impermanence. Uh, things are shifting. This is stress, this stressful and anxiety producing. What can I do with this?
So earlier this year, I, I experienced a really profound loss. My mother um, died in January earlier this year. Um, not of COVID, but um, through kind of lax healthcare, having to do with the COVID surge here in LA, she didn't get the care that she needed. So I consider it kind of uh, her death a result of COVID, uh, the COVID phenomena in a way. And um, it's a profound loss. And I always knew that um, she would pass, of course. To know on one level that mortality is here and much older than me, of course, and the chances of her dying before I did was um, pretty high just because of the, the aspect of what it is to be a person, to be a child of somebody you grow and it's an older person. And this, this was going to happen probably, and it did at some point, right? But to know that on one level and to experience it with the heart, it's just so, so difficult, so difficult. So this is where kind of this aspect of the Dharma's teaching kind of inspired me with this teaching of impermanence and dukkha related. That it's okay to, to notice that this is a part of my experience of all humanity's experience. It's not, I'm wrong for feeling bad or this is kind of, um, how could I not react in a different way? It's like, this is the impermanence showing up in my life in a way that I kind of knew on one level and another level was, um, really hard. So this is a continual practice of this normalization of, this is what it is to be a person. I'm not wrong for noticing this and that there's this suffering in my life. So what can be the response to this suffering? I think this is where um, the, the building blocks of compassion and kindness and even empathy can, can um, can bloom, right? To really deeply recognize that in one's life is where freedom can arise. It doesn't mean that things aren't hard or difficult, that heartache doesn't occur. The Buddha is also teaching, also gives us this wisdom of what it is to have compassion and kindness, right? It's always there, these teachings of uh, freedom, it means freedom of the heart as well. So it's okay. This is a part of our lives. I think sometimes um, when I notice in these teachings, they saw them impermanence and suffering. And I kind of fell into this too at some point. Um, was like, well, if I know that there's going to be a permanence, I I shouldn't feel bad, which became like a, just another trap. <laughs> it's like uh, just another way to beat myself up. And also a subtle way to kind of disengage like in, in, in a way that created some level of like heartlessness to other people's losses. Like I wasn't really present. I couldn't really be compassionate. It's like, well, didn't you know that there was going to be impermanence? It's not so much these teachings are not that we're not human anymore. There's this aspect of our, of our being that um, in order to thrive, to have some stability in our lives, we actually need some kind of stability. I was talking to somebody last week. I was um, teaching in person on three marks of existence and I was talking to somebody that attended this group and she said to me, well, I'm a mother. And of course, in order for my children to thrive, they need to have stability. I don't, we never get rid of that. We need some stability, right? You know, uh, in order to kind of thrive in a human existence. There's nothing wrong with that. And we have an existence that there isn't any permanence too. So I think it's really, it's a part of the human experience to, to have, these moments of anxiety or stress or this tension. It's almost this contradiction that we all live with. So how do we respond to it? The Buddha's teachings are there is a, there is a way 
to have a response to where we can have some freedom moment to moment. And one way is this kind of, where is it possible to have some compassion and kindness for ourselves and for other people? So to have this kind of deep practice with the, these aspects of the three marks of existence can create these windows of opportunity. We can have freer hearts and move with a little bit more ease through all the changes of our lives. But then there's this uh, connection, right? This third aspect of a no self. Different, there's different translations of this, um, this teaching. Anatta as no self or emptiness. So there's so many different aspects and I struggle with it myself, but I'll, I'll offer kind of my own perspective or my own insights or practice as a student myself of the Dharma. So uh, really moved by this one teaching, this explanation of no self that I um, feel really honored to come upon this, uh, this Gil Franz doll. I'm really, really happy that I've been able to sit in his classes and to, uh, you know, occasionally when I've been able to travel up to the, to Redwood City and read his teachings. And I remember feeling really moved by this teaching he gave that uh, this no self is, that the Buddha is responding his lifetime to a teaching that the self in his particular cultural place and time in Northern India 2,600 years ago, that the concept of the self, what was popular, popularized at the time is that there's an aspect of the self that never changes, that is immovable and eternal and um, will always be there. That there's kind of like this atomic sense of the self that cannot be divisible. And his response to that, well, that's not true. We live in a world of, of conditions of cause and effect. And the self is more multi-layered and nuanced than far more than that. And really depends on the conditions of any one given time and the different layers of who we are. So there's, um, Really fine-tuned teachings on what those layers are, but I'll just kind of go over them just a tiny bit here. I'd love to be on a retreat with you all and we can talk about no self, but just wanted to kind of give kind of an intro um, aspect or intro kind of um, teaching on this. It's kind of like, I think of almost like the self, like how we see different weather conditions like clouds in the sky, there are certain conditions that arise that come together to create these, these aspects, these things that we see in the sky that we give names to. Like there's a certain name for, um, like I think it's like a nimbus cloud or clouds that bear rain or different kind of fluffy cauliflower clouds. There's a different name for those. And that at a certain point, they dissipate. You know, rainbows, there's a certain conditions that arise from uh, the prism of light through um, and of water. And then there's rainbows. A more destructive example, hurricanes are conditions that come together where a hurricane can feel very real and very much is, and then there's a dissipation. I think of myself as sometimes as just uh, this example of all these historical causes and conditions that had to arise in order for me to be here. I have Mexican heritage. I think of um, what had to happen in, um, in Spain, Hernan Cortes coming to Mexico, the, the meeting of Aztecs and the conquistadors and all the historical kind of waves of colonization and even genocide that had to arise for my family to even exist. And just the physical kind of manifestation of uh, the body being mostly water, right? hydrogen, oxygen, the 32 parts of the body, all of these aspects of who we are, who I am, uh, come together for a certain amount of time, a certain point in time. And then the, the body is, there's ends, there's mortality. And at some point the conditions will, will um, 
kind of arm permanent. So they will uh, dissipate and there won't be um, me anymore. So all of these aspects of the self are far more dynamic and multi-layered and dependent on another than at first glance. Of course, there's a relative me and you, I have a separate body than you and so forth, but um, there's more to it than, than that. And so there's so many ways of describing what I just said. I'm not the only one who describes like no self. And there's so many ways of looking at that and gleaning different insights from the no self teaching. They're not being like one core way of being. But one way that I found and that I'd like to share that I found useful just in kind of kind of exploring an insight is that who I am or who anybody else is, is not easily definable. And there can be so much suffering involved in kind of labeling to the point to where there's kind of no spaciousness or letting go of who we think we are or who we think somebody else is. One small example, I, I'm, a, I'm a librarian by profession. And my profession has changed a lot over the last 20, 30 years. I guess with um, the increase of services that are, that are now available because of um, the internet, and especially now with broadband access and Wi-Fi access. Sometimes people have come into the library and said, well, where's the card catalog? We haven't used those in 35 years at least most public libraries. And this, you know, I haven't been a librarian. I wasn't a librarian back then. I was in middle school when we started getting rid of uh, card catalogs, but I hear these stories of, of librarians kind of like refusing to go over to the card, to online computers and, and saving the card catalog and just really like uh, refusing to let it go. And I think of that sometimes as like this pain of like definition of this is who I am. This is what we do. And not being able to serve the communities that we serve because of hanging on to this definition of this is what a librarian does. We only deal with paper and the suffering over that of not being able to change, to respond to current conditions and not being able to really see into what our community needs right now people around us are changing too and don't need the same thing. So our definition of who we are can continuously change. And holding on to any one aspect of this is who I am and that's it, whatever that is, can potentially lead to a lot of suffering. So the questions that come up to, for me, and this is, a question that doesn't get answered within like any particular time. It can be a whole lifetime of what it is that we're doing with any one aspect of my identity, right? Or your identity, whoever's identity. I'm not one thing. I identify as Chicana, a Mexican American too. I don't have one identity. I'm a woman. What that is, is multi-layered and faceted. There's not one way to be a woman, right? How much suffering could, could occur? But I was like, I'm only this one thing and I cannot change. Or I don't, I don't know what that is to be something that I don't relate to. If somebody said, you know, I noticed that you're being a certain way. Or Eileen, you know, you're kind of inconsiderate there. If I was like, I'm not an inconsiderate person. How could you say that? How could it be open to maybe relating to what is, wanting what is appropriate at the moment. Maybe my behavior was. If I'm hanging on to an idea of like, I'm a nice person, how could I be anything else but that? Is that really helpful? So these are kind of these open questions that we can ask ourselves throughout our own lifetime. Of where is our identity, our idea of identity not helpful? Maybe where are there aspects that we can hold lightly? Because there will always be change. We're not the same from moment to moment. A song can change us. It can be happy one moment and sad the next over like 
a piece of music for some of us. So I, I, you know, like I said, we can have like, we can sit together and have a whole retreat on this, but I just wanted to give like some introductory concepts. And I'm, and my hope is that I'm raising more questions than answers. We find our own answers. We find our own way and we have a lifetime to find our own way. We kind of discover the different layers of these teachings and what kind of insights they can give to us moment to moment with impermanence, finding where there's that, the rough spots where we're, where we're grasping and holding on, where the suffering is over change, where that kind of suffering can come up in our own identities. Because we are part of the conditions too. We are part of life. Life around us changes and we are part of that. So there's that interconnectedness of change and impermanence. We're not separate. There's all these opportunities, these growth points of where we can create more freedom for ourselves and for other people. Because we don't do this alone. We sit in community. We're sitting to here together as a community of practitioners, even here on Zoom. The Buddha taught in the, in the, the context of community. We don't seek alone and we don't, we don't have to ask questions alone either. So I want to I want to thank you for your time and your attention and listening, and for this uh, this opportunity to practice with you in community. So thank you.